Hello, fellow Scratchers. I'm Griff Patch, and as promised, I'm back with another fun episode of Classic Platformer. And this time, we are introducing a brand new enemy class of the spiky red flying ball kind. <laughs> wow, how cool is that? Yeah, you don't want to be touching this guy, right? And stay tuned, because later on in this episode, we'll be adding a more complex movement mechanic designed to keep your players on their toes. Guys, load up your projects from where we left off in the last episode, and let's get scratching. So my idea is to introduce a new flying enemy class, and I think a good place for them to spawn is right here on the second scene. So stop the projects right there, and click into the enemy sprite. We are going to need a new costume for this, and I'm thinking to make this guy like a really spiky ball, almost like a red conker, with all those prickly spines all over them. I find it easiest to create spikes around an object if you draw the opposite spikes first, and then group them. This then allows you to rotate them together around the middle of your enemy, and ends up with a much more even result. Great, I love that. Let's name this costume Spikeball the Fearsome. Well, maybe just Spikeball. So now that we have the costume drawn, we need to officially add them to our level. That's under the When I Receive Change Scene script, right? Duplicate an existing if check. We want to only spawn the spiky enemy on scene. Scene 2, that's it. If scene equals 2, then spawn. And we can copy in the current sprite's x and y position from the stage. As for direction, okay, so this enemy wants to move up and down. That's a direction of zero. Just remember that we can come back here and enter any direction that we want, and that should allow the enemy to move in all sorts of directions. Now the name of this enemy can be spike one. And aha, the first time we've had the opportunity to set the enemy type here on the left not being the red chomper enemy this time, but a spike ball. But hold that thought, come down to our define spawn scripts below. What you'll notice is that the enemy type we pass in into our custom block here, this input, is never used in the script. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's true, because well, this is the first time we've added a different type of enemy. We are going to need a way to keep track of this input from now on. Make a new variable named type. And make sure it's for this sprite only. And then we can set the type variable right away at the top here to the passed in type input variable. Great, now we have a record of what type of enemy we are creating. So what happens next? Well, the new enemy clone is created with the type variable set. Scroll up to find the when I start as clone script. Here it is. And as things stand, this script is only relevant to our red patrolling enemy Chomper right now. There's no point in trying to reuse the same scripts because the motion is going to be very different for our spike ball. So instead, let's make sure these scripts here only run for the enemy type named red. If type equals red, then yes, we want to run these scripts. But rather than nest all these scripts inside one big if, I prefer instead to use a guard condition, where we say when this is not a red enemy, we don't run this script, stop the scripts here, and pop that in at the top. It's up to you which way you prefer to do this, perhaps the first was cleaner, I don't know, I just have this thing about avoiding nesting blocks within each other wherever possible. So that's good. We should now find that the red enemies spawn as before but also that the spiky enemy is excluded, as it has never been made visible on the screen. What we can do now though is duplicate this when I start as clone script. That's right, we can have more than one run at once, but this time we'll only allow a type of spike ball to execute this script. To show this working, switch costume to spike ball, and then slap that green flag. It's testing time. Red and red, and spike ball, woohoo! Sitting rather wryly on top of my apple. Hmm, we need them to start moving up and down. Whatever. And since we are already pointing in the up direction, we just move three steps forward. Worthy of another quick test. And okay, we are in business. 
My plan though is to have them collide with the ceiling and then return back down once more. But hold it right there. Not wanting to recode something we've done before, if you can find our define move left and right script, you'll see that we have a very comprehensive list of sprites to check the collisions with. <clears throat> and yes, we need to check them all again for the spiky enemy. The answer is to refer back to our player sprite and find our clever check touching solid script. This worked wonders for the player and will work just as well for our enemies. So drag it into the enemy sprite. But as you can see, the enemy is checking for collisions with many more sprites than our player does. So tell you what, let's shake this up a bit. We'll keep the set touching block, but rather than using the OR logic, I'm going to use ADDITION, adding together the results of touching level with the result of touching the edge of the screen. The interesting result of touching both at the same time is that this will result in a value of 2, which is really rather neat. Then, because this script is getting rather wide, I'm going to break this into two lines using a CHANGE touching. Careful now, make sure the first one was a set block followed by a CHANGE block. And we change by touching safe zones, add touching platforms. Coolio! That's all the four possibilities. Let's see that in action. When the enemy is touching the level, we get a touching value of 1. And when they are not colliding, a touching value of 0. Even more fun, when they are touching the edge and the level, we get a touching value of 2. Pretty funky, right? And that means we can now really simplify the enemy touching scripts back up here. We just need to ensure we check touching solid. And then we want to know when we are not colliding with anything solid. So that's simple. It's just touching equals zero. That's so much cleaner. But don't assume we got it right. Test, test, test. Do red enemies still collide with the walls and turn around? Yes, they do. Great job. So now we can return to our spiky dude. They must now check for solid collisions too. That's in our second when I start as clone script. Make sure it's for the spike ball. Okay, let me just move that out into some free space of its own. After we move forward by three, that's here, we again check touching solid. If touching is greater than zero, then we have indeed collided. So what do we do? We do a 180 and turn fully around to point in the opposite direction. Also, let's have the player wait before continuing on uh, for just 0.2 of a second. Whoops, I didn't mean to click the script then, but actually that's pretty cool because it means we can see this script in action as they collide with the level, pause and then set off back down again. That's really neat. Personally though, I feel that they are getting a little bit too close to the wall. I want them to always leave a little gap. Now, we could already achieve this effect by using our safe zone sprite. Do you remember how we can draw out an area where our enemies can't enter? This is great for adding special patrol zones for enemies. See, and it works a treat. At least once you have them starting out of a zone, that is. But it is a bit annoying having to rely on all these safe zones when I want this to be the default behaviour for this enemy. So scrap that safe zone and we'll do it another way. All we need to do is have the enemy check for collisions just a number of steps ahead of where they are now. That is, we secretly move them not by three steps, but three plus an extra, say, 16 steps. But then as soon as we've checked the collisions, we quickly move them back again by minus 16 steps. That'll leave us exactly where we expected to be in the first place, just three steps forward. Does that make sense? I hope so, because that's all there is to it. Hit the green flag and let's see this in action. Up and down, up, down, and we have a very clean 16 pixel gap every time. Nice one. And it's great fun dodging this new threat. <laughs> However, I did expect this enemy to be a bit more deadly than this. So we haven't yet added back in the collisions with the player, but 
Careful here because it's not as simple as just dropping them in this forever loop. After all, how would we check the collisions in this wait statement? Or the glide if we were using them? We need to look for a collision at the same time as running this script. In which case, we just need another when I start as clone script. Again, running when the type is spikeball. But this time, forever checking for collisions with the player sprite. Except we fell into this bug before. If you remember with our collisions with the old red enemy over here, we need to also check for invulnerable variable to stop the death sound looping over and over as we die. Only then do we go ahead and broadcast lose life. See this in action, we must re-enter the scene. So let me start this all over again. And now, a quick dodge. Ha! <laughs> but yes, we do now die from touching the spiky ball. Huzzah and hooray! Well, that would be a fine time to stop the lesson. But guys, I don't wanna. Shall we cram in one more enemy movement pattern before we end? I'm thinking of placing a homing enemy right here at the top scene. That is, an enemy that follows the player. Let's start them up here. A new spawn block is needed for scene 103. The enemy type can be spike ball space homing. Still a spike ball, only a homing one. Give it a unique ID and fill out its starting X and Y position. Great. So where's our when I start as clone for spike ball? We'll want a new script for the new homing spike ball. But before we action that, come down to the checks for when the player touches the spike ball we just added, because this type equals spike ball will not work when we're using a spike ball homing. But we can make it work. Just swap the equals check for a green contains block. Now, if the type variable contains the word spike, then it matches any spiky enemy at all. Cool, you know what, this is overly complicated. Let's remove the not and just have the forever loop inside the if instead. Yes, it's more nested, but it's perhaps easier to read in this case. Right, back up and let's make that homing script. Duplicate the spike ball script and check for a type of spike ball homing. We can discard all the movement scripts inside this forever loop and start by waiting for one second. Then point towards the player and we'll begin our movement. Repeat 45 times and we're going to dash forward. So move forward by four, no, maybe five steps at a time. That will be fast. Go, go, go. Right here we are. And oh man. Okay, let's try that again. Up we go. And this time, no, no. Okay, I changed my mind. Move by four steps after all. Five was too quick. Let's try that again. Well, guys, that brings us to the end of today's episode. It was fun bringing more diversity to this classic platformer. Do smash that like button if you enjoyed this episode too. And hey, why don't you drop me a comment under this video with your ideas for enemies you'd like to introduce. Now, in the coming episodes, I'm switching it up and looking to introduce some more advanced player moves too, like their sliding and the highly requested double jumping mechanic. So do make sure to subscribe to the channel and check the bell icon to ensure you don't miss the next exciting episode. But until then, do have a great week ahead and scratch on, guys. Bye.